creative mind, exploring the art of thinking by Forrest Kinney. Creating and Thinking. The painter Raphael is often considered to be one of the great masters of the High Renaissance, along with Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci. He reportedly once said, when one is thinking, one cannot create. Now whether he actually said this or not, it expresses an interesting point about thinking and creating. From my experience, when I'm freely improvising at the piano, creating music that's not based on a known tune or on anything I've heard before, I'm not thinking either about chords or scales or what I'm going to do next. I'm immersed in a swirling world of feelings and sounds, a world that moves far too quickly for thought. In this state of mind, I'm responding to those sounds and feelings and to the sensations in my body that swim by. I experience a flowing state of mind that thought only seems to interrupt in a rather clumsy way. Others have recognized this phenomena in other fields. There was a famous baseball player named Yogi Berra. During one stretch of his career, he was striking out nearly all the time. So his coach asked him to not just swing at anything, but think more about each pitch. Yogi replied, how can you hit and think at the same time? He was referring to what has often been called the paralysis of analysis. In a dynamic activity, we can't be consciously thinking about what we're doing, or we aren't really able to do it well. There's that famous parable about the centipede who was walking along just fine until he was asked to explain exactly how he managed to coordinate all his legs. As the centipede began to analyze his movements, he found he could no longer walk. This is why the essayist William Hazlitt once wrote, we never do anything well until we cease to think about the manner of doing it. If only the centipede had kept that in mind. So all this raises the question, while there can certainly be an art of thinking when it comes to logic or to debate, what does an art of thinking look like in a creative life, that is, when we're creating? Is there a place for it? Yes. We tend to think of art as a product, something that's created, then packaged and sold. But art is not fundamentally a product, it's a practice. It's something we do often, perhaps every day. This is true whether we're painting pictures, or playing a musical instrument, or even working as a healer. After all, doctors call their work their practice. To become skillful and artistic at nearly anything requires regular practice. So the art of thinking is, at root, a practice we do each day. But why? And how? First, let's consider why a practice of thinking is so valuable in a creative life. The main reason is that without knowing it, we're already constantly practicing a way of thinking that reduces our creative options. Most of our normal everyday thinking is like a funnel. We start out with a lot of options in front of us and we reduce them to one or two. I call this selective thinking because we select just one or two options out of many. Or we could call it reductive thinking because we reduce many options to just a few. We see all these colors and choose just one or two to paint the house. We see all these doors and we enter just one. We see these candies and we choose one and then maybe we choose another one. In the previous video, we saw how this process of reducing options is at the very root of our thinking. We look at this image and we see a golden goblet or perhaps we see two black silhouettes. When we do manage to see both, we really can't see them simultaneously. Or we see two plus two, but we don't see that this is simultaneously minus two and minus two from the viewpoint of the apple tree. We're always seeing just a part of a complete picture. Even when the moon is fully illuminated, we still are only seeing the side of the moon that faces us and not the side turned away. So since we're constantly and unconsciously practicing reductive thinking and perceiving, we can understand why we need to practice ways of thinking that counter this. But how do we do this? 
What we need to do is flip that funnel over. We need to start with an option or with a way of thinking and then generate other options and other ways of thinking. I call this generative thinking because we're generating many options rather than selecting one. We could also call it expansive thinking because we're expanding the possibilities rather than contracting them. In general, we're starting with something or a way of thinking and then generating a field of possibilities around it. All the following videos in this series present practices that show you how you can generate a wider field of options around a limited way of thinking. For example, in the video called Both Neither, we explore a practice that immediately reveals hidden options and restores neglected possibilities whenever we're thinking in a binary way. So, when you're thinking of going left, you can of course consider going right instead. The both neither practice asks us to then consider that you might find it best to do both, to go both left and right, perhaps one after the other, and to consider that these two directions may not be as mutually exclusive as they first appear. The both neither practice then suggests that you could do neither, and this opens the door to new possibilities that you might not have considered before. By practicing this technique of both neither, when confronted with a set of binary options such as left-right, we feel more free to travel in any direction. If our thinking only allows us to turn left or right, but not both or not to move forward, we will be trapped within the limits of our own thinking and often confused and conflicted as we navigate the complexities of life. By widening our thinking and expanding our options through a practice such as both neither, we can not only understand our world better, but we can live more creative and fulfilling lives. Here's another way to think about the importance of a practice of thinking. Sitting like this day after day, we know that this guy would be incapable of dancing like this. His body is too stiff, too stuck, too habituated to one way of moving. He is severely limited in how he can move and what he can do. This dancer is stretching, is doing some yoga to warm up her muscles and expand her range of movement. So she's capable of moving in a much freer way, perhaps something like this. Practicing what I call generative thinking is like what this dancer is doing when she's stretching. Our everyday ways of thinking limit the range of movement in our minds. So practicing generative thinking is like limbering up the mind so we have more options and we can live a more creative life. Through doing practices such as both neither, we become accustomed to generating many options rather than just selecting a few. And we regularly break out of our mental habits and our minds become much more flexible and open and able to respond to inspirations and the challenges that come our way. Thomas Edison, who was awarded over a thousand patents, reportedly completed over a thousand experiments to create the first light bulb. Experimenting, exploring, generating new options each day, that was his practice. He was limbering up and preparing his mind, and then one day, Eureka, he was able to create the light bulb. So each of the following videos in this series explore a different way of thinking, a way of generating options in those places that our current ways of thinking deny them. The first group of videos help us step out of the severe limits of binary thinking, and then the next group of videos is about a wide range of topics. There is a natural delight in generating creative options and variations. My hope is that you experience this natural delight as you watch the following videos and practice the art of thinking.